Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. It's so good to be here with you. If this is your first time being here with us, I pray that it's not your last. Welcome. Welcome to our worship service here online from wherever you're watching and however you're watching. We want to welcome you to this time. I hope you could feel the welcome right through your device. Uh, But as we gather to worship in this strange new reality of We do things online, we do things in person. We hope that this will genuinely be a time where you feel like you could connect with God and even connect with all of us who are in the room. Well, we are in the tail end of our sermon series called Jesus is Greater Than. And the whole idea of this series from the beginning was to kind of address the elephant in the room. Look at everything going on around us. Look at the year that was, the year that's starting to be, and we're seeing nothing but problems and challenges and obstacles everywhere and just we think we see some light at the end of the tunnel it's like that tunnel just keeps getting longer this feels like the longest winter ever and we're not even halfway through it so man it's um it's been a difficult challenge and you can see why people have been struggling in their view of God you can see why even Christians have been struggling with their faith It's a tough time. And the good news is God never puts people in the penalty box for struggling. But I don't think he wants to leave you in a state of struggle. I think he wants to lift you from that and show you how to flourish. Maybe in a way you never would have before. To show you what's in front of you, not just what's around you or behind you. And that that thing in front of you is something that is good. That he's still in control. He still has a plan for your life. And your plan has to do with his cosmic, global plan of salvation. Of his kingdom come here and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, we've been talking a lot about this. And the biggest challenge is that, of course, people look at everything going on around them. And they start building a theology of God based on difficult circumstances. Which gets you all twisted up inside. It gets your idea of God very much twisted up. And so we've been asking a question, okay, well, how do we untwist that? What would help people see God differently? What would create a paradigm shift? That's the question we're asking. What would cause a paradigm shift for a 21st century American? Well, it certainly probably isn't going to be things that worked in the past in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, it's not going to be probably church the way most of us grew up understanding it. It's going to have to be such a radical explosion of God's truth out into the world that people can't help but be changed by it. If it's going to be anything, it's going to be Jesus Christ. It's, it's not necessarily going to be all the, the tools of ministry as much as it's going to be introducing people to Jesus which is what the tools of ministry are supposed to do, but they don't always. It's about being really crazy focused on knowing who Jesus really is. Because when you know who Jesus really is, you know who you really are. And you understand how to interpret everything that's going on around you. You could see the big picture, not just the few feet right in front of you. So, knowing who Jesus really is. And so, people talk about, like, well... So if I know that Jesus is the Savior, I know he died on the cross for my sins, he is or was God incarnate in flesh, what is all of that salvation stuff, how does that apply to me actually? Like what are the mechanics of that? How do I get what Jesus offers? And last week we talked about you get it through faith. Faith is the key that unlocks the door. Faith is The catalyst, faith is the thing that makes possible receiving what Jesus did for us. Faith is like putting on corrective lenses. I remember when my daughter Katie first kind of let us know that she couldn't see. And she was in school and she kept talking about it. She was dropping hints, but we are too slow. We didn't put it together. That she would have to sit in the front of the class so that she could see well. And, you know, finally, I remember when we discovered that, yeah, I think she needs glasses, and we got her checked out, and we got her the glasses, and she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is how everybody else sees. I had no idea what I was missing. It's so clear. And of course, she never wants to go back, whether it's 
putting on her contacts or having her glasses around. She never wants to go back to life without the corrective lenses. And I think that's a lot like faith. Faith in Jesus Christ brings clarity. The whole world becomes HD. We see things as they really are. And we never want to go back. We never want to go back to that fuzzy existence. We see things, all the beauty and all the pain, but we see things as they really are. Faith does that. And our lives are built on faith. We're hardwired for faith. We have faith in systems. Talked about this last week. Faith in systems. Faith in people. So then why is faith in God such a constant mystery to us? That somehow we look at people's faith and we're like, oh my gosh, I can't have faith like that. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Did you, do you see what they went through and they came out the other side believing in God still? Do you see what they went through and they didn't lose it? They didn't fall apart? They still had hope and even joy in the midst of their suffering? How? Are they deluded? What is that? No, it's faith. Well, that's a miracle. We talked about how it looks miraculous to us to see other people with great faith. But maybe Jesus was on to something, maybe, just maybe, when he said all you and I needed was the faith the size of a mustard seed. Maybe what seems miraculous is the result of practice. Practicing your faith over and over. Practicing trusting God in every area of your life over and over again. Small stuff, small stuff, big stuff, big stuff. Until then, you get to a point in your faith where you just trust God. No matter how hard it gets, you trust that he's going to come through. And people look at that and they're like, that's a miracle. Say, yeah, but it's a miracle that's born through practice. And you can have that miracle of faith too. So, what does it mean? What does it mean to practice my faith? How do I actually live it? And this is the next step of the journey that Paul explains in the book of Hebrews. Remember, we've been tracking with the book of Hebrews because it was written at a time a lot like this one. There was a big national crisis going on. It was political, it was religious, and, you know, uh, people had a lot of wrong ideas about God, and Paul was trying to set them straight onto who Jesus really was. So he, he next shifts into, this is Hebrews chapter 12, he shifts into talking about this then is how you're to live your life of faith. So here we go, chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So Paul says this journey of faith, and we'll talk about the sin that entangles us, but this journey of faith is like a race. I love the idea of faith, this life of faith being a race. I think there's so many things that help us understand what faith is all about. But you may be asking, well, why a race? Why does that make sense? Well, think about a race for a minute. Think about how it's different from going for a jog or going for a run. It's different, right? There's a different expectation. You bring a different sense of urgency to it, right? It's not just a jog. You're on the clock. It has a start and it has a finish. I love the idea of it being a race because a race has stages, right? You've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I feel like depending on where you are in your relationship with God and your faith journey, you're in a different stage. And there are different strategies of running the race depending on the stage you're in. And I love that. I love that we're all in the race. We're just at different points on the track. And so those of us who've been a little further ahead, we could loop back around and say, oh yeah, I'll tell you exactly how to run this next part. And then those of us who are behind and we look to other people ahead of us, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for somebody to tell me how long I have to keep going before the the ground levels out, right? (laughs) Or we stop going up this incline. I love to you that a race is something that's marked out. What do I mean? Well, if you go sign up to run a 5K or a 10K, the course is marked out for you. Somebody took the time to make sure it was the right distance. They took care of the traffic. Uh, They took care of setting it all up so that you could run the race without thinking about it. And what, what it says here, what Paul says, is this is a race marked out for us. God has your race marked out that he wants you to run. And he's designed it in such a way that you're going to run it. And he wants you to run it as effectively and joyfully as you can. And if you think about a race too, it's marked out in other ways. Not just that the track's the right distance, but you know, if they're going to bring you through 
this area in New Jersey, they're probably going to take you to a place where you could see a view of New York City, right? They want to show you some natural beauty. They might run you through downtown Red Bank to show you some character. And then they also want to make sure that it's not just a flat race. It's got some hills. It's got a challenge to it. Why? Because there is something more meaningful if there's a challenge. And I feel like this is what God puts into our race. Beauty and character and challenge so that we get more joy from the race as a result. So I love this idea that faith is a race. Now let's go back to that first part he talks about because we don't always run the race well. He talks about this sin that ensnares us, that entangles us. It's like we got something on our legs. If you remember uh, the film Forrest Gump, remember when he has his magic shoes and, and he's got those braces and he's trying to run away from the bullies and he can't. It's like this is us because of the sin that entangles us. The things that get in our way of following Jesus well. It's like we've, they're braces we put on ourselves willingly um, by, by how we're focusing our lives. And until we break free, we can't really run the race with joy. Now, of course, we can't break free ourselves. We need Jesus to break us free. And that's where his grace and freedom comes in. But uh, even in this instance, right? So what's this sin? What is entangling us? It could be a lot of things. It could be you might have uh, some habitual sin in your life that keeps causing you to trip, keeps causing you to stumble. You might have some hurt left over from someone else's sins that have been like a barrier, like weights around your ankles, like braces on your legs that are preventing you from moving forward in faith. Again, It's not wrong to be where you are. You are where you are. And we all have to deal with what we have to deal with. But I think the Lord wants to set you free because I think he's got a beautiful race ahead. All right. So then we ask, okay, well then how? How do we do it? How do we run the race well? Okay, we know that we don't need to be entangled by sin. Okay, that's good. But how do, tell me, pastor, what to do. Well, Paul answers this in the very next verse. Verse two, fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's how. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus being the pioneer of salvation, and we asked, what's a pioneer? The first one of its kind. Jesus shows us the way to salvation. So why wouldn't we follow him? He shows us how to get there. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He shows us exactly what it looks like to live in faithfulness. How does he show us? He lived it. And because of the Holy Spirit in us, he can continue to live it in us, through us. And we start to understand what this Christian life is all about. Uh, you've, many of you have heard this story before, but I always think of it when I think of this first. And that's when I was 12 years old and I was running the Chinatown 10K. Um, this is in Los Angeles. And I, my stepfather signed me up. We had sort of a family thing. Him and a couple of his brothers are going to run it. They signed me up to run it. And I never trained. 12 years old, never trained for a 10K. And uh, let's just say I'm not built like a gazelle, okay? I'm not built like a natural runner. So, this was not a good recipe. And as we get started in this 10K, uh, my stepdad takes off. Like he just, he's gone. He's going for his personal best. I don't know. But I'm here like in Chinatown. I don't know what's going on. I'm 12 years old. I, I start running and I realize very quickly, this is useless. I'm not going to last very long. And it was my uncle Frank who ran the race next to me, who kind of appeared out of nowhere and said, Jason, you're not going to quit. I'm like, yeah, yes, I am. But then I started thinking, like, how do I even quit? I don't even know where I am. How do I, this wasn't cell phone days, right? I don't know, what do I do? Do I go back to the beginning? Do I walk the, I have no idea. So my uncle Frank like, no, you're going to do this. I promise you can do this. And I'm like, I can't. He's like, you can't. Just, I'm going to run right in front of you. Just stare at my back. Don't worry about anything else going on around. Just look at my back. Focus on that. And we're going to run this race. And I said, but what if you run too fast? Like, I'm not going to run too fast. I'll run at the right speed for you to follow me. 
Sure enough, I ran the 10K, whole thing, across the tape with my Uncle Frank. It was awesome. It was not only a real, you know, meaningful moment for me as a kid, but it taught me a really valuable lesson that I didn't know Jesus was teaching me. That this is what it's like in faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is how we follow him. Don't worry about everything going on around you. That stuff comes and goes. Don't worry about how far you have left to go or how far you've been. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Do you know who's using this principle right now? I'm, I mean, I doubt they know they're using this principle, but is um, all the, the workout groups. So iFit, if anybody is using iFit right now, so, so we bought an elliptical machine and it came with the iFit subscription. And so now I follow the trainers through different parts of the world and they, they lead me on hikes and runs and things like that. It's amazing. But it's the same exact principle. I find the time and the workout goes by like that because I'm following them. They're telling me each step of the way. They never leave. They're instructing me the whole time. They tell me when to ramp it up, when to notch it down. And I get through it and I feel great and I have joy. Now that's a great endorsement. They should pay me for that. But the principle is the same when it comes to us following Jesus. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we know we can do it because he did it. And he promises he's going to take us with him. Paul puts it this way. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what's that mean for you and me and our faith? Well, I think it means I need to live my life with Jesus in front of me. I need to live my life in such a way that I'm purposefully running with Jesus in front of me. What's that look like? I think it looks like me in a position of humility on my knees every day. Jesus, where do you want me to go today in my faith, in my family, in my finances, in my fun? What do you have in store for me? Lord, I, I want to do this, and if it's your will... I want it to be part of, you know, is this the plan that you have for me? Is this part of fulfilling my purpose? Or is this just something cool that I really want to do? Whatever it is, I want to run with you right in front of me. I don't want to get into any area of my life where I'm choosing to say, you know what, Jesus, I got this one. Running the race of faith is about complete sold out trust in the pioneer. Fixing our eyes on Jesus every step of the way. And we do it through Bible study. And we do it through prayer. We do it through spiritual disciplines, which now we're going into Lent. Next week, we're going to start our new sermon series. It's going to talk about how to dial in to hear God's voice through life's noise. So here's the thing, though. If I were to start running without training, that would probably be a disaster. I know a lot of people, they say, okay, you know, I'm going to read the whole Bible. And I'm going to get tuned into God. And And they go all out. And they set huge goals. And they usually just fall flat because they realize it's not sustainable. They haven't developed a rhythm. It's like in any kind of training, right? You have to train if you're going to run the race well. And it's not, the training isn't always going to be easy, right? Training never really is. It's going to take discipline. And I, that's where I just lost you, <laughs> right? Discipline. Nobody loves that D word, right? Discipline. Actually, there's some people that love it, but most people, they hear discipline and they want to run the other way. But listen, discipline is life-giving. If you get into a discipline of whatever it is to make you healthier, whether it's exercise or, or diet or spiritual practices, whatever it is, that discipline is going to be freeing. It's very counterintuitive. We think uh, discipline is something that's limiting, but it's actually something that frees us. It develops good, right habits, even godly habits in us. It helps us to train so that we can run the race that God has given us to run well. So honestly, the hardest part is getting started. It's just like any workout. The hardest part is about the first 10 minutes. Because your body's like, no, I want to be at rest. (laughs) No, I don't want to move. And and you feel it. But then once you get into it, what happens? Body starts loosening up. You start hitting your cadence. You start feeling good. And by the time you get to the end... You, you might be tired, but you feel you've got an exhilaration about you. you got some feel good because of what your body has just gone through. This is true in the spiritual life. Start a little bit at a time. 
maybe during Lent you want to think about taking on a spiritual practice. Like, you know, I'm going to pray three minutes a day. I'm going to set the timer on my iPhone for three minutes and I'm going to pray. You don't have to start with huge, I'm going to read the entire New Testament by Thursday. Right? I just, I don't know how much good that's really going to do anyway. But what can you add at the beginning as you train for this race? Aristotle gives us a little pep talk. He says, discipline, through discipline comes freedom. Paul wasn't so great at pep talks, <laughs> although the stakes were much higher. He was talking to Christians who were afraid of getting persecuted really badly. And he gives them some tough love, which I think we in our kind of cushy Christianity here in America, we could probably hear some of this tough love. He says it this way. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. In other words, look at how far Jesus went. Don't tell me I have it hard. He had it harder. Be strong and courageous. Run this race with great faith. Because the one who ran it in front of you, who showed you the way, he took all the hits. He says this way about discipline. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Amen. That should go on a coffee mug. That should be like, there should be a whole line of things. Anyway. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, I love this line, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. That's some tough love. Are you really? I mean, listen, people say this all the time. I've tried everything to grow in my relationship with God. Really? You tried everything? Or did you try one Bible study and you didn't like it? Well, I, I tried reading the Bible. Really? Did you really try? I tried praying. and never really, not. Did you? I mean, Really? <laughs> I think we need to give ourselves a little tough love to get going because the hardest part's getting started. So uh, let me give you three steps that you can maybe start with this week as a way of kind of untangling this idea a little bit more. So three steps to train your faith. This isn't like three easy steps and you'll have awesome Mother Teresa faith. No. This is just maybe it's a starting point or maybe it triggers a starting point for you. The first is I call it deal with it you got to deal with maybe the habits or the hurts that are still like anchors around your legs. And if it comes to habits, maybe you need to get someone who could be accountable with you to help you. Maybe even some counseling. I mean, the hurts that other people have wronged you with, that probably could use some counseling. It could use some, at least some talking about it, some praying through it you got to deal with that stuff or it's going to keep tripping you up in your attempt to run this race. Got to deal with it. Can't ignore it anymore. You can't fix what you can't acknowledge. I'll put it this way. You can't allow the Lord to fix what you're not willing to acknowledge. All right, the second one. Decide to do it. It's kind of like, you know, when you go out, you go out and buy the new running shoes or the new fitness gear and you're all jazzed up and you, and you never do anything, Right? By the machine and it goes to live in the attic or becomes a great place to hang your clothes. You, you got to decide to do it. It's not enough to go buy a Bible. It's not enough to say, oh, I'm going to come to church. That's not the entirety of your journey. That, those are good starts, but you got to decide to do it. And then third, you got to let God deliver. Deliver you from a less than life to show you what it looks like to live a greater than life. And that's what this is all about, right? How do we know Jesus so well? And how do we practice our faith, faith so that we can live a greater than life? To know that Jesus is greater than all this stuff. All of this will pass away. But he remains forever. And us with him forever. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us in this series. And hope you'll catch us next week as we start our Lenten series on spiritual practices. Amen.